Hello, good afternoon. My name is Mark Post from Maastricht University, and I'm going to talk about the future of meat, which is an exciting uh, subject. Happy to be at the LEAP Summit in Zagreb, and fortunately I cannot be in Zagreb um, physically because of Corona, of course. Feeding the world is a complex problem, and especially because we are going to get to 9 or 10 billion people on this planet, um, and because they are going to get more sophisticated needs for different types of food. Especially meat is a particular problem because it's a very resource intense part of our diet. A lot of water is used, a lot of energy, a lot of land, um, and a lot of feed. And, and why is that? Why is meat such a incredibly in intense material. Uh, that's because animals are pretty inefficient in converting their feed, which we have to grow on the fields, into food, into animal proteins. And particularly, cows are extremely inefficient. You have to feed them about eight times as much calories and proteins as you get out um, of the meat. <coughs> and that means that currently we are already using 70% of all our agricultural land on this planet to actually feed animals. Not only cows, also chicken, pork, and uh, pigs, and, and so forth. But according to the FAO, in 2050 we will need twice as much meat as we currently have. Um, or actually 70% more meat as we currently have, because the demand is growing, growing from 7 to 10 billion people, but also in India and China and other areas where people used to be not rich enough to be able to afford meat, now will become rich enough and they will start to eat meat, more meat than they typically do. And if you do that math, our planet is just not big enough to accommodate all that um, production of feed for animals. So we need to do something about this. In addition, and this is recently uh, more and more kind of um, publicized in, in regular newspapers, livestock agriculture of cows in particular uh, contributes a lot to greenhouse gas emission. Uh, it's especially methane in the case of cows and other ruminants, um, but it's also CO2. And the equivalent is pretty much about between 15 and 20 percent of all greenhouse gas emission on this planet coming from animals, especially the livestock animals. So also there we need to do something about it. Now we can all become vegetarian, where there's nothing against that, um, but as the FAO predicts, this is not going to happen at a global scale anytime soon. So what are the alternatives? Well, this is a muscle cell. You may remember that from um, high school biology. It's actually a big cell um, consisting of many, many different cells that are kind of melted together. Um, and they have these cross striations that are made by the interwoven proteins in that muscle that make it contract and relax. Now, in um, the 60s and later in uh, 2000, it was discovered that some of those cells are kind of attached to that muscle fiber, but they're not really part of it. And these turned out to be the stem cells of our muscle. They are sitting in all our muscle cells and also in most animals and most mammals and, and, and fish and uh, birds. And there are the stem cells. They are sitting there waiting to repair tissue when it's injured. So when you rupture your muscle, these guys come in, they proliferate, and they form a new piece of muscle. A wonderful um, repair system. Now we can take those cells out. Um, and we can actually make meat out of that without the cow. And since these cells have a tremendous proliferative capacity, um, you can actually create from a very small piece of muscle a lot of meat. <clears throat> now, we also take that very same piece of muscle and we make fat tissue out of it because eventually you want to have and the muscle tissue and the fat tissue to make nice meat. 
So the process looks like this. We start with a biopsy, which is kind of a needle sticking into, for instance, the butt of a cow. You get a small piece of muscle out of it, let's say half a gram, um, and then you isolate the cells from it. Um, as I mentioned, we have a number of cells in there, so we use the muscle cells and the fat cells, and then we let them proliferate separately. Muscle cells in one container, mus uh, fat cells in the other container, until we have trillions and trillions of these cells. Um, and then we let them make tissue. Uh, for muscle, that's again different than for fat, but we let them make tissue, and then the tissue eventually kind of, we call that differentiation, um, and they eventually will make a muscle fiber or a fat tissue that is essentially the same as you are used to if you take it right out of the cow. And of course, after that, we uh, put the muscle and the fat together and we make a hamburger out of it. We have done this for the first time in 2013. It was very, very expensive. I'll come back to that later. Uh, but it was identified as meat. So that's a it's a very nice system, uh, but still you need to work a lot on the details to make that a reality and to make that something that you can, you know, five years from now can actually eat. So, um, as I mentioned, these cells have a very, very high proliferative capacity, meaning that uh, currently from half a gram of this tissue, we can actually make 2,000 kilos of meat. And that effectively translates into a big reduction in the number of cows that we need, and therefore a reduction in all the resources that the cow needs to grow uh, meat. <clears throat> so this is an example of a hamburger that we made uh, again in, in 2013. It was very, very expensive, like a quarter million euro to make this in 2013. So we need to uh, work on that. So that's nice, then you, then you show that you can do this, but then you need to make a product out of it. So how do you scale that up? How do you make that cheap? Um, and how do you make it as nice as meat is as a tissue? So because we do this in, in very confined and very um, precise conditions, we can actually play with those conditions to uh, eventually improve that process. One big thing is scaling up um, cell culture and tissue culture in the lab is not really easily scalable, but it's doable. So we um, used a method that has been used in cell therapy in the medical application. Most of these technologies are actually from the medical field. Um, and we uh, basically we use microcarriers where we grow the cells on microcarriers. You see here, um, I don't know whether you can see my, uh, my uh, pointer, but you see um, all the big um, spheres. Um, they are uh, still quite, quite small, but all the little dots on those spheres are the cells. They are attaching to those spheres, and the spheres are then suspended in a big soup of um, feed, basically, because also the cells need to be fed. <coughs> so what it then turns out to be this process is you start with a very small number of cells, then you grow gradually in bigger systems, more and more cells, again, on these microcarriers, and then eventually you end up with these large tanks, pretty much like a brewery, where the cells are growing in those um, what we call bioreactors. Um, as I mentioned, we, we, we uh, culture them on these microspheres. Here you see one microsphere and the cells are actually now in sort of grayish on top of that microsphere. So you need to separate the microspheres, the microcarriers from uh, the cells and eventually you make uh, fat tissue and muscle tissue out of it. If you think about that and if you do some calculations um, and you would try to think what that would mean for to replace a particular farm, let's say an average farm in the Netherlands with 250 cows, which produces about 35 tons of meat per year, then <coughs> uh, that would translate in about four of those tanks, each of the thousand liters, um, and that would replace the entire farm. So that's perfectly doable. If you want to look what it looks like at a world scale to replace the entire beef production by uh, cultured beef production, then you would need about uh, one and a half 
times the uh, tanks that we currently have for brewing beer, wine, um, all the and, and medical products and all the other fermentation processes. So it's it's essentially doable, and of course it would mean a lot for um, uh, the environment, but also how we use land and and stuff like that. We could revert a lot of land to forest, basically. Now it also needs to be sustainable. That's very dear to our heart. That's the reason why we're doing this. Um, and in cell culture, some of the products that you typically use are not really sustainable. So we had to replace all of them. One particular example is uh, serum. Serum is a blood product coming from blood, mostly from cows. Um, and usually that's required to grow cells outside of the body. And of course, we didn't want to do that because then you would still need a lot of cows to grow the material. And so we um, sought replacements for this. This We were not the first one doing this. A lot of other people have done this before, not particular for ourselves. So we had to kind of optimize it for ourselves. But here you see in these curves, some of those um, serum-free feeds, medium, we call it serum-free media, um, actually work as nice as um, serum containing media um, itself. So we have kind of cracked that problem and now we don't need to use serum anymore to grow these cells. On a larger scale, if you look at this process, what would that mean for land saving and water saving and energy saving? So for that, life cycle analysis have been done. Uh, they're kind of preliminary because the process is not really described yet or really finalized yet. So they're always, they were called anticipatory life cycle analysis. Uh, so they're based on a number of assumptions. So you have to take it with a little bit of a grain of salt. But most of the life cycle analysis that have been done actually end up with kind of similar conclusions towards land saving and water saving, a lot of land saving and maybe even 90% of land being saved, um, which makes sense because that cow was very inefficient in producing protein and this process can become much more efficient. A lot of water saving because you can recycle a lot of the material, it's all contained in a building uh, with bioreactors so you can recycle your, your water. Um, and um, energy saving, uh, and in this particular study it was like 60% energy saving, but to be, to be fair, some of the life cycle analysis that have been done after that are not so sure about that energy saving. So that's still something that we need to uh, be very um, sensitive to and look uh, whether we can improve that and really reach that uh, energy saving. Of course you might wonder um, is this, is this product actually tasty? Is it the same as meat or is it, um, you know, kind of a, um, kind of a, a knockoff? So we spent a lot of time improving the quality of that beef. Initially in 2013, the, the taster said, yeah, this is fine. Um, but there was still no fat in it, for instance. So it was not really the best hamburger that you can think of. Um, and of course here, you want to look at the right color, the right texture, um, and, and the right taste. So one of the things, there are a lot of aspects to that, but because of time, I, I cannot really cover all of them. Um, but for instance, fat tissue is something that we are currently creating. Um, and that was a little bit of a problem because most fat tissue production has been described in the medical literature, strangely enough. Um, but that was not really compatible with food production. We required a couple of um, uh, materials like um, things like IBMX and dexamethasone and indomethacin and insulin. Um, and these are all compounds that you don't typically associate with um, food production. So we figured out a way to circumvent these um, and do this with materials that are more natural and not really um, as uh, obtrusive as these ones. So currently we are quite successful in making fat tissue. Actually, most of the cells that we isolate um, turn into fat cells. Um, surprisingly, it takes twice as long to produce a fat cell than a muscle cell. You wouldn't think that, but that's um, actually the case. So um, 
but it is successful and uh, actually the, the fat composition of that, that fat tissue is exactly the same as of fat tissue of a cow. So um, currently we add that to the hamburger. Um, this will also give you, by the way, the opportunity to make that fat more, um, more healthy for you. So you can play a little bit with the composition of the feed so that the cells actually make more unsaturated fatty acids like uh, omega-3 fatty acids. This process allows us to make minced meat and not um, full thickness uh, steaks like a ribeye steak. Uh, and for that, we need to have additional kind of technologies that are out there. They are also used in the medical field, but we have to implement them into this to uh, make a full thickness steak. So that's a, that's a later version. There's actually one company uh, doing that right now, uh, but they are not as advanced yet. Um, and speaking of other technologies to replace meat, um, uh, this is somewhat of a, um, a, a difficult slide, I guess, but here on the left upper corner you have muscle, um, and if you zoom in on that muscle, you get the muscle bundles, the, 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 the fibers, uh, then you get the individual cells, which again for muscle is not one individual cell, but a, a number of melted cells. And then if you really zoom down, you get the proteins. And muscle is very, very protein rich, as you probably know. And because these are these contractile muscles, um, a lot of the proteins are actually uh, the two contractile proteins that are necessary for this contraction, being actin and myosin. So if you, if you think about a replacement, you can go um, from the, the bottom up. So first you, you could actually have uh, bacteria or yeast make muscle proteins and then you make a soup of muscle protein. So that's kind of protein based. Whether it will look or feel or taste like muscle, we don't know. Nobody has done this before, but there are now companies focusing on this. Then you can go to cell-based, basically using those cells, the muscle cells and the fat cells, and make a mixture out of them. Um, the next step is that you go fiber-based, um, let the cells make a muscle fiber, that's what we do, or a fat tissue, and then combine these little tissues into a minced meat product. And then you can all the way, you can go all the way up to tissue-based, which is what, um, for instance, ALEF is doing and trying to make the entire tissue. Um, when we introduced this in 2013, uh, every, a lot of people said, uh, yuck, you know, we don't want this. This doesn't feel good. This, doesn't, this may not taste good. Um, and it's an interesting response. So we are uh, somewhat resistant to innovation in our food, which makes sense. We are biologically programmed not to eat things that we don't know. Now, in the Netherlands, we have an interesting product. It's called the frikandel, um, and uh, it's meat, but nobody actually knows what it is, uh, and nobody knows how it's made, and most people don't want to know what it is, and it's very, very popular. So, on the one hand, we are kind of risk-averse against novelty in our food. On the other hand, we can actually eat things that we really don't know, as long as we feel that they are safe and other people are eating it as well. So that requires time and some marketing, but eventually, I'm pretty sure, we will get there. Um, there are a couple of other aspects to it, but one I want to highlight, and that is that meat is a little bit more than just a consumption product, a consumer product. It's a culture. It's um, you know associated with hunting, with fire, with masculinity, with power, and you may kind of frown and say, well, then, you know, I don't know, not anymore probably, and for sure that's changing, but there's still an element to it. Um, and if you start culturing it, all those kind of masculine power, fire, hunting connotations disappear, it becomes a product that is relatively safe and made in a factory. Um, so it becomes a little bit more like a vegetable, um, kind of an innocent piece of, a, a part of our diet. And so I think these products are, even if they are exactly the same and nutritionally completely equivalent, culturally they will still be kind of in between meat and um, uh, vegetable. Now, 
uh, although those initial responses were like yuck, um, since then, a fair number of surveys have been done where people are being asked, you know, do you think this is a good idea? Do you want to eat this? Do you want to replace your meat consumption with uh, cultured meat consumption? Um, and a lot of those surveys have been done, up to about 25 or so right now, in different geographies uh, throughout the world. And what seems, if you, if you focus on the blue bars here, um, uh, over the years, starting in 2013, actually the first one was in 2011, uh, towards uh, approximately now, you see a gradually in gradual increase in this acceptance of this product. Because people start to hear about it, they start to think about it, they get more information and uh, they say, well, you know, this might not be such a bad idea. Of course, this is not determining what people are going to do in the supermarket um, when they have to make these choices, but um, it's at least a start. I mentioned that this is very expensive to make, um, and cell culture is typically expensive, and that's because of all the, all the materials are actually in the medical field coming from the medical field. So everything is expensive and some things are really crazily expensive. So we have worked on that quite a bit um, and made a lot of calculations um, and assumptions also, uh, you know, recycling, um, replacing some of the very expensive components by very cheap components that, that is totally possible. Um, and then you arrive at something like um, um, 140 euro per kilo, which is still very, very high. Um, and so we have thought about that too. How can you make it even cheaper? And then you get down to really the feed of these cells. In meat, 80% of the cost is actually animal feed. And in cells, it's not really very different. So it's mostly that feed. So currently, and the feed again is medical grade, pharmaceutical grade, very, very expensive and, and very, very special. And it may not need to be that way. So currently we are replacing that feed with basically feed that we make ourselves coming from regular um, feedstock like uh, fodder beets and uh, peas or soybeans. And for the vitamins, we use bacteria because bacteria are very good at making vitamins. Um, and if you do that, you can get that price of meat down to the price of regular meat and maybe even below that. That's not going to happen, you know, next year um, or in the next three or four years, but it's going to happen um, pretty quickly. When we started in 2013, we were the only ones in the world and currently there are around 60 companies worldwide um, doing this not only on beef, also on pork, on chicken, on fish, on um, uh, other, uh, on shrimp, for instance. So there are many companies uh, currently working in this field um, and they're all kind of in this stage, not all, but most of them are in the stage of scaling up production and getting regulatory approval. Why regulatory approval? Um, that's because this is considered a novel food. Um, and if it, for, this is a European term, so in Europe it's considered a novel food. That means that the European Food Safety Authority needs to approve this before it can enter the market. Um, and that means that the company, our company for instance, needs to provide all the evidence that this is absolutely safe. And um, after um, EFSA has approved this, um, it can enter the market. It's a process that takes about a year and a half, so it's not um, anytime soon. This is not genetically modified, which is um, beneficial for getting approval, especially in Europe, um, but still it's a novel food, so you need to go through that. So the, the vision, the futuristic meat, um, is actually quite the same as we um, have it right now. Um, we like you to be able to still eat meat in the near future um, and in the far future, pretty much as you know it, but without all the negative consequences on animal welfare, environment, um, and safety. 
And with that, I would like to conclude. Um, and I'm sure there are going to be questions and comments, and I'm happy to entertain them. Have a great day.